Good afternoon and welcome uh, to our uh, School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, webinar. I'm Gary Martinini, the Dean of the school, and uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you today. Um, I'm really excited uh, to uh, welcome our, our speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Graziella Tonfoni. Um, uh, a couple of decades ago, um, uh, <laughs> Uh, I was at the University of Maryland and um, uh, Graziella was visiting MIT and um, I learned about her work in um, <clears throat> trying to add visual annotations to text to actually uh, um, you know, try to make things more understandable uh, uh, and annot annotate things from sort of uh, uh, a point of view of intent rather than just the tokens of the words that uh, we typically use to index. And so I was fascinated. Um, we, uh, we, um, uh, she, she was uh, uh, able to come down to, to Maryland, give some talks and spend a little time. And that led to her, her work on, on information architecture. Um, so um, I, it's, a, it's really uh, fun to uh, go back and think about those days and then all the things in between then and now and uh, as uh, she has been thinking about a scholar's life and a scholar's work and what happens to our, our, our work uh, over, over time. And so I think this, uh, this talk will be particularly interesting for people who are interested in repositories and the, uh, the connection and longevity of, of knowledge. Um, um, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Tonfoni received her uh, PhD in linguistics uh, from the University of Bologna and uh, was a, a research professor of applied and computational linguistics there from uh, 1983 to 2015. Uh, she's the author of more than a dozen books, uh, including Writing as a Visual Art, uh, uh, which uh, is, is, the, is the first book that I, I was uh, really um, engaged with, uh, and then uh, Information Design, the, the Knowledge Architects uh, Toolbook. Uh, she received the Minerva Award for Outstanding Women in Science in 1984. She's been a member of the uh, uh, American Associate, uh, Association of Artificial Intelligence, the Italian Association for Artificial Intelligence, and the Information Design um, British Society. So um, we're really pleased to have her today. I'm, f I'm really fascinated by her talk. Um, she's going to be talking about what she calls information distress as a kind of global pathology. Uh, and um, uh, this, this is um, very timely. Um, we, she has some ideas about new kinds of tools, classifications, uh, and approaches um, that uh, we might uh, take to dealing with these globally connected, but inconsistently con uh, connected uh, knowledge bases. Uh, so that we can get to some level of uh, noise reduction and better understanding and sharing. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tonfoni. Good afternoon, and I want to start by thanking and by expressing my appreciation for Dean Marcianini, who not only captured immediately the essence of my work many years ago, as he mentioned, with uh, my books at the time, but also capture the essence of my work now by mm, packaging in some, in some way the first slide, who Susan Sylvester, who I also thank you for collaboration and for collaborating with me on, in this speech, will show you. The title is actually very meaningful because it's about meaning management in a globally networked world. A speech like this would have not been necessarily 20 years ago, and it is urgent today. So it means that something in between must have happened. We were living when we were in the pre-social network era, let's call it this way, roughly, you know, it's a period, uh, at some point there was a turning page, but in some way, let's, let's define it, the pre-social network era versus the ongoing social network era. Um, at those times, we had, uh, being a list linguist by origin, I tend to play with words a lot. We were locally networked, networking means that scientists will carve their work 
very accurately, making it very neat, making sure there were no scruffy elements in our theories. There was time to do that. And there was a whole cycle. You create your research, you verify parts of it. There is a local community discussing it and you are expecting scholars there and colleagues to be very nasty at your theory and try to destroy it. If they don't destroy it, that means it's a very good one. And move on to publications and you know, high reputation uh, publishers, uh, good journals, reviews, all of that. Now, the situation has radically changed. And in my analysis over the last uh, years, also the reason to reconnect uh, over the ocean with Dean Marcinini was my concern about those like us who have been working in both uh, times frames, the pre-web, <laughs> pre-social network era, and continuing our work uh, in this social network era with the promise and the expectation that our work will move on to the future. My analysis has led me to uh, see that large and, and, and in some way assess that large and well-established literary and scientific estates, let's call it this way, are threatened much more than smaller little production. Because when some work, when a set of articles and books become very large, it is less manageable and it is harder to in some way package this work and make it uh, useful for the future because there is a risk of erosion due to a full access and many misunderstanding which may occur due to interconnectivity and the fact that we are all so much connected all the time that a lot of things are taken for granted, whereas they are not. Okay, second slide, image two. Uh, let me just um, briefly add that in the course of the last four years, I have been daily in an observatory mode. Means uh, I've been exploring the origin and expansion of info disorders of various kinds, which were for in some way turning into a pathology uh, named or which we can define as info distress. So different than information design. Now we have information distress, first uh, two capital letter ID, but very different uh, definition. And uh, there were a lot of misunderstandings, misrepresentation, and also affecting obviously and influencing decision making, policy making, and uh, individuals' modes of reasoning. Um, also reducing, as I've been working out on the cognitive observation and impairing reading and listening cognitive capacities by individuals overwhelmed. And uh, this is a broader consideration because it also affects other areas, not just research, but also administration and uh, policy making and, and documentation getting easily lost and changing completely the direction of a certain research field or of a certain decision uh, made. A definition of information distress in image three is just um, a combination of distraction, disruption, uh, caused by often irrelevant events, um, tagged or considered to be meaningful ones, along with, of course, derivative report-making disorders based on data which haven't been reported accurately, dysfunctionalities in dialogue, conversation conveyed out of context, producing fake news and forged views. Many times relevant issues are dismissed and meaningful questions unanswered. Wrong deduction, a conglomerate of look like solid statement, growing rapidly in a snowball effect. Now image four. Uh, my observations are extracted, therefore, out of a much wider and very thick macro, mega report I composed and compacted out of a set of micro reports which had a lot of anecdotal knowledge, 
but also a lot of verified uh, uh, data. And uh, um, at some point, I felt like there was a tremendous need to uh, create some extra tools, not because our archivists or librarians don't already have tools. Uh, we have a whole library science tradition which has uh, uh, been working and uh, operating beautifully. Unfortunately, today, because of this overwhelming quantity of texts and data, we have uh, uh, waves of documents and waves of publication, and we need extra layer, uh, a cartography in some way, to be placed on top of what we already use to uh, catalog, classify our work. And I came without, you know, I came down with this set of acronyms, rare in my own work, which is anyone scholar's work at point after 35 years of writing and researching and conveying knowledge uh, via well, lectures or seminars or classes. There is a lot of rare in classics, which means a lot of uh, research, which was extremely good at the time it was uh, stabilized verified and, uh, and consolidated, but just like um, an Etruscan piece of jewelry, we couldn't wear it. I mean, it belongs to a past which can be inspirational for us. For instance, I had the, uh, the privilege of being part of a golden era of artificial intelligence, working and collaborating with the pioneers of AI. And if I see artificial intelligence today, uh, I don't, I, I can't recognize it because it's so different. And so uh, inspiration when we look at a discipline which has moved so fast to become something different, even if it keeps the same name. And then we have, and then I came down, I came up with some other um, classification. Conceptually liquid means lectures, teaching materials and manuals, which is absorbed material because has been in some way uh, distributed around, quoted and unquoted document, referenced and unreferenced documents and pages, obsolete and obsolescence. And to just provide an example, the kind of education, the kind of uh, programs which were started in the past for multimedia education were about. Uh, um, in some way helping students or not just students, individuals use the computer beside and uh, along with other tools. Now we only more or less have the computer. So this uh, multimedia training and education becomes like, as I said, a trust jewelry. We can inspire ourselves or make it become a history of the discipline because of the discipline. And then we have a lot of other uh, definitions such as lost and now found, a lot of uh, manuscripts or drafts which help uh, our readers understand how we got to some conclusion, how we and why we assessed some theories as opposed to others, may be lost or not yet found and come back again or can be accessed, but generically they have been modified because there were missing pieces. It means that the digital era, which was in between these two periods, has been also a time of selection. So selection is, has been mostly, some, some time has been very much monitored, some other time has been more arbitrary. Now we need to be the selector as author of our own work. And we need in some way to acknowledge that not necessarily librarians and archivists can do it for us as authors or scholars. So there is an extra uh, amount of work on our side because image 4A, um, the perception of uh, a research has changed and is constantly changing. As a scientist with a you know, um, background in uh, um, artificial intelligence, I like to use metaphors 
and analogies a lot. And uh, the real uh, metaphor I find, I found to uh, describe what we see now in research is uh, sliding disciplinary areas, that disciplines change like in tectonics and like uh, Earth, there is a lot of movement there. And for instance, uh, we happen to see that in a discipline such as information science, in order to protect your theory, which is no longer being practiced or because there is an innovation and innovation of innovation and uh, there is a triple innovation at times and uh, there is never a time to stabilize, uh, you need to uh, place your work immediately into history of that discipline because it's more likely that you are going to keep it if it's history, even if it was just five years ago. This is a little bit of a paradox, but um, my observation come out of my experience of the last, uh, um, let's say, 20 years, most of which, well, let's say uh, this research started in um, 2016, so in Europe. Uh, in Europe, we have even more confusion because of a language issue and uh, assuming that um, in some way a translation of one language goes to language number two and that's it is not true. Most of the time a translation goes through language three, four, five, six, seven and after that the text comes out completely different. So this observation made me think that we have to be very careful and, um, and often, more often than uh, we have ever been, um, very much scrutinizing data and where assert assertion and where texts come from, especially when we see them coming from Europe, is, not, is, a, uh, is a fact that not always is English the carrier most of the time we have globalized assessment coming from local dispersed uh, pieces of research. Sometimes they are not connected, so there needs to be a lot of scrutiny on that part. Okay, slide five, very briefly. There is an image. Uh, image five is just my archive showing that, <laughs> that what you see on shelves is books and printed. Uh, papers and essays, what you see in the closet in some way, even if they are open, is drafts and the preliminary versions to get to that. So using another metaphor here, you have um, uh, the petrified forest on, on the bottom with stra stratification of concept, uh, disciplines, a, a big mix, and then you have um, you have the painted desert on top of that, which is the colors which emerge out of the books and out of the real printed matters. Okay, so let me go uh, fast to image five, six to say that I am currently working about a predict forward model, uh, being concerned with what will happen to my research, the one I'm doing now because uh, uh, in this era, and uh, forget for a second about the archive of the past, which has nice uh, categories already, and has been in some way, um, I'm not saying it's complete, but it, there is certainly a set of bibliographies and there is a way to move around, just because readers expect it to be historical, <laughs> not to have to go hands on with that to represent periods of history of the disciplines. Now, in image six, I'm just uh, pulling out a few words and a new metaphor, a new metaphor for economics of information today. What we write and what we research today uh, will have uh, to be um, considered as economics, is in finance. We have, we will have to take into account reading sustainability by readers, there is, and uh, 
difference between long-term time and attention investors, students, day-by-day -day page traders, which in this case uh, are translators and their sentiment, and, uh, and universities are a little bit like banks, banks which uh, select in some way, they have stockholders and shareholders, professors and, uh, and teachers and students, and uh, will have to pull up, pull up some relevant question like, are you a reader expecting to have a margin of learning out of your time investment? And learning will be plural. Learnings, which kind of learning? Just informative one and hands-on, or what you expect out of each of these uh, uh, materials, which will then be catalogued and preserved. Um, and more than so, as these times are so turbulent, we go through con constantly through perturbation in our research environment, everything is accelerated and then there is a slowdown and then there is a, a, a change. Uh, fundamental final question, is this item, research item, coming out of the bubble sector because there are a bubble sector in research today, or is it based upon consolidated and stabilized knowledge? This becomes in some way the question for the future. And this is the system I'm working on right now. Image seven, very fast, because I know I'm running out of time. More relevant question always to be asked are, um, are you able, uh, in order to be able to trust results, and it's about reliability of our sources of information, anytime we address issues of packaging research, and then deciding that that research is so important that we need to keep it. And therefore, we need to either archive it or pull it into a library or anyway select, because not everything can go through um, at our times of overwhelming amount of documents. Who was in charge of this research become a relevant question. Where does this research come from? Our conclusion reached based upon tested or untested or partially tested information. How were data extracted? Where and when were data collected and selected? Which was the observation mode and mood? And this info noise reduction, reduction is so much needed that uh, bad news for scholars, right? That they have to be in charge of this part as well. They can't let all of this uh, be done by even the best librarian or the best archivist. They have to collaborate because it's only themselves, and the scholars and the author, who know and make and package even a self-criticism, self-reviewing, because not necessarily will we have that availability and the time to pass the work to someone else. So it's a new cycle in some way. The old cycle, as I mentioned at the beginning, had those protagonists, you know, authors, scholars, uh, locally deciding what is good and what is not. And today we have universities, which do have a tremendous opportunity, by the way. You know, universities, banks, which uh, provide titles to investors, investors being students, and the quality of titles is guaranteed by professor and researcher. In there. So let me cl just close now with a, you know, in some way, a positive and constructive comment. We are entering, hopefully, after such confusion era, the entering of recuperation and promotion of solid research. Now let's let's allow space for the conversation. Thanks so much, uh, Graziella. Um, I was trying to take uh, take notes as you were talking. Um, you know, um, I was um, you know, I'm really fascinated by the the way you use metaphors, uh, and I know this is uh, important. And it, it it's um, yeah, it's very telling that in today's world, where um, as you point out, where uh, I, I think I'm in my third iteration of AI is going to save the world. Uh, and uh, uh, but one thing that we know that uh, machines don't do very well are things like metaphors or or uh, um, and, and um, when it, have you have you thought about um, um, you were talking about 
uh, not even the best uh, librarian or archivist could actually alone kind of make these connections and 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 manage uh, th these these knowledge bases. Um, what kinds of teams would you like to see? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, would would um, would you work with um, uh, say uh, a linguist and a computer programmer and an archivist to begin to try to uh, take that rich collection of physical uh, things you showed us and then connect them to all of the digital uh, stuff that uh, you know represents some of the same things but also other things. I mean, what kind of teams would you envision us putting together to, to kind of solve these problems? Actually, you mentioned them all. I would need a um, computer expert, but also archivist, librarian, and, our, and the, the whole team, because we live in an interdisciplinary world today, and all these uh, um, uh, professional uh, professionalities are needed. Um, we talk interdisciplinarity, but we also need to promote intradisciplinarity, which means uh, the selection that, that groups like this may make uh, along with the research uh, specialist as to what material may go through at what level of depth. For instance, there can be an essay which is important, but is not as important as a piece of as a page. So the author may have to say, okay, I will sacrifice, quote, an entire book because it's been captured by this page. And those are major selection. And, um, and uh, these uh, choices do have consequences. So little things, but dedicated to just an author, a scientist at a time. And the scientist will be the one in charge still because he or she is the only one who really knows the work in details. And it, you know, it comes close to you know, literature where the narrator, the poet is just one. And uh, it's hard work, but if we want to guarantee you know, that uh, our work, our research becomes consolidated today, we need that. We need that team. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, you, you know, um, I, I know that uh, here at uh, UNC, there's a, a Carolina Digital Repository that um, uh, the library operates. And uh, when a professor retires, um, they, they can donate their um, you know, m uh, materials uh, to the repository. Um, unfortunately, uh, like other digital repositories, what tends to happen is uh, if I decide to, I'm going to retire, um, I, um, I may just box everything up uh, or zip up all my files and say here uh, and hand it off and then not have, take any responsibility for it. And what we don't ha have in the academy is a mechanism for uh, what we might call knowledge trade-off or knowledge management at the end of career, uh, where we might uh, almost insist that a scholar take a year with pay, of course, uh, to um, uh, um, work with the librarians or archivists or, or technical people in the digital repository to add the metadata, to uh, give those descriptions, to answer the questions, uh, and to add annotations and connections, and um, uh, I wish I, I I wish I could say that I see good signs of that happening, but um, right now it's it's extremely expensive and difficult. Uh, somebody who has to really care enough to take that time and effort to work with uh, somebody uh, in the repository to make sure that those materials are indexed and made available and properly connected. Yeah, uh, I, I fully agree. It's very expensive. It's not being done. It's not being done here. <laughs> uh, it's actually, I had to, you know, catalog my archive as private, uh, in private initiative because uh, universities overwhelmed and uh, money is not there. But I, as you mentioned, I like a lot to use metaphor and I said, 
I needed to create an interpretive infrastructure for the future. And this is like a, an insurance company. I have to become my own insurance company to ensure that meaning I intended to give and research I intended to package is not being misunderstood. Because what I also noticed sometimes when I meant that people, uh, you know, that the, there is uh, uh, in some way a decay in reading capabilities, uh, people are distracted, whatever. You may also see that a piece that you are quoted in a way which you didn't intend to be quoted, that they misunderstood and eventually hooked up your name to a paragraph which has nothing to do with what you intended to say, especially between and among languages, you know, because... Uh, Europe, uh, uh, but not just Europe, even there, I'm sure you transition through different periods of time and, and words matter a lot. So in some way, each scholar needs to become uh, his or her own uh, uh, insurer in policy maker. And uh, mm -hmm. in the interpretive infrastructure is so uh, relevant today. For instance, when I sent you more material than our, our speech today, is because if I were to repeat the speech, I would say, read this before or read it after, because um, it's already a selection of a selection of a selection. I've made that selection already. So unfortunately, it's more work on faculty or scholars aside once they are done. Um, the university I worked for, the University of Bologna, is so overwhelmed that um, you know archives need to proliferate. There is a proliferation of archives, but uh, after all, there is no guarantee for any university that university may keep the essence. And for for me, it's very important because I also consider myself to have been a witness of very of many important times in the history of different disciplines. You know started with Noam Chomsky in linguistics, where I visited, first time I visited MIT, and then came Marvin Minsky and Patrick Winston, and then the great time at, at uh, Maryland and George Wa and also George Washington University. In some way, in my life, I always happened uh, to be in the peak times in the different disciplines, you know, and then I would move uh, close by. So I feel a commitment uh, to, for instance, make sure the generation at least know who were the pioneers of those disciplines, like also yourself, uh, Dean Marcianini, has been and uh, has been one of the pioneers in the digital library sector. And when once the people were when when scholar were starting uh, that, and uh, uh, and that's that was so different than it is now, you know. And so um, when once you are also protagonist of the golden age of the different disciplines, you have one more responsibility, not just to yourself, but uh, for students and scholar to package that materials and move it on through times. And um, probably, as I mentioned before, had not the, you know, the, the web uh, had the expansion, the extreme expansion and uh, the, the globalization hadn't been so extreme, so dramatic, probably we wouldn't be addressing this issue so, you know, in such an emergency <laughs> situation, we would have more confidence that maybe our, you know, students or follow followers in, in an academic sense, uh, you know, our um, doctoral students and PhD could do that uh, as it was the normal, so-called normal situation in the past. No, that's not guaranteed. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I, I really like this this concept of being a witness uh, because I, I think that that uh, uses a, a much more potent kind of um, responsibility uh, than um, um, uh, than than I guess I, I usually think of, of sort of what our responsibilities are to not only our own work, but to the work of the people that, um, you know, we've uh, interacted with uh, uh, throughout a career. Um, I, mean, I might like to return to that, but I, I had a couple of other uh, sort of topics I, I wanted to um, raise. You, um, you use this term um, uh, textual cartographer, which I love. I, I think that's uh, it's quite quite interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about you know, what you mean by that? I, I mean, I know your work and 
terms of, of trying to use what you called, um, you know, visual machines to actually, you know, um, uh, try to annotate uh, um, um, uh, meaning in, in documents. Uh, uh, is that what you mean by textual cartographers? Uh, and, and how would we train those people? Yeah, right. Well, that visual system which you mentioned, when I developed that, it was also about it was about the style, most about styles, narrate versus definition versus explanation, being analytical, synthetical. That goes into the paragraph dimension. But now we need something more beside that, which is. Uh, for instance, viewing uh, our work as scholar as a landscape. <laughs> when you have a visitor moving from one side to another one and you have to create a path, and uh, a cartographer is the one who may create a legend, legend in the sense of uh, um, a list of acronyms and so referring to, well, if you move right, you'll find uh, a piece which is about the history of linguistics. If you move to the other direction, you may actually have another piece of, of, uh, of a report or essays which will uh, expand on that topic. So it will be basically topics and um, a way to connect those topics so that someone who enters that landscape, this would be a good ap application for computer in computer vision, can find a way to see how you ended up creating those conclusions to a certain article or assessment by, see by seeing the process. What is missing today is how did I get there? You know, the, the manuscript part, the drafted version part. So cartography can be used for that. Uh, this way, you can also establish better, you know, keep those uh, criteria which we had of uh, st how do we stabilize research that is stabilized. You find someone who is objecting to your conclusion, you can demonstrate how you got there. Cartography may help. That kind of textual cartography. On top of, the, of course, the situation is moving. As I mentioned, there is... Uh, uh, there is a lot of, but that is a possibility which uh, I still envision as the future, as the future for preservation and not only preservation, but recuperation, recoup of a lot of concepts which are lost. So it sounds like um, the, the uh, textual cartographer almost needs to be the the creator, the author, uh, or the, the team that's um, generating the original content. I guess I was I was um, uh, w wondering if um, you know if if, if we had um, um, uh, we we educate a lot of uh, archival students, and can we get them to be thinking about what it might mean uh, to be a textual cartographer or a visual cartographer or um, you know, wh what are the kinds of, of things that, um, you know, we, we, we might be able to, um, to teach them. And um, I guess just like um, a geographer would learn the art of map making and um, then adding dynamics, uh, um, maybe it is possible that in our archives and library classes, we could at least provide some base tools uh, because you know we can't we can't depend on um, on individual creators to do this because our lives are finite and and so uh, eventually for the knowledge to persist and continue to be used uh, it, it it'll need those um, those maps uh, and those connections to be um, refreshed and updated uh, over time yeah, I saw it in a very dramatic way, especially probably being, as I said, in environment where there are also many languages and confusion is exponentially growing. I saw it as, as an emergency and I say otherwise we'll have uh, entire stretches of documentation of history will be gone forever. So it became, a, you know, in some way a, a global warning, <laughs> not warming, a global warming 
because we have no local verification the way we used to have. You know, the beauty of uh, university in the past, not to be too much of a nostalgic, but technically, you know, we would be sitting there and decide which books go on shelves, which manuals are we going to use, uh, which percentage of time should we dedicate to a topic as opposed to another one. There was a lot of that was actually the beauty and the sentiment of this, you know, interdisciplinary work. And now that's all gone. As far as I know, at least it's gone. The places I have been uh, lately, I haven't seen any of that. You know, even before COVID, you know, it was already very much dispersed and dissipated and scattered pieces of information here and there and people making connection, which made absolutely no sense. And it was such a pain for someone who has been training, creating powerful analogies and not near misses, but I mean, real analogies to, to see this analogical uh, wrong way of reasoning analogically can make can make a terrible disasters come true. So it became an emergency, emergency, and I started working on this uh, forward-looking archive that even if, for instance, the younger generation will have in some way to confront that any uh, to confront the issue of the future. So in, I think in, in that the terminology interpretive infrastructure is important. Uh, it's never been there before, not because people were not making, you know, mistakes or misunderstanding, but misunderstanding could be as not, never as big as this ones we see now because of the global <laughs> interconnection we have, where the snowball effect becomes huge, <laughs> and unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, so not, not only do, do um, sort of good ideas propagate, but errors uh, propagate. Right. And they're never taken care of once they become too large. You know, sometimes we used to say when uh, things were slower in some way, <laughs> the teaching, the learning, the writing, there, is, there will be a way uh, errors, mistakes get absorbed. Now, no, it takes, uh, you, know, um, you know, truth, maybe just one person. And even if a, a group of 100 people agrees about something which is not true, that doesn't become true <laughs> because it's a majority of people saying it's true. But <laughs> because we are all interconnected, that's something which uh, happens a lot. And uh, for those uh, who have been involved into a different way of operating is, um, uh, is difficult. It's something difficult to accept. And so here uh, we should provide tools not to have that happen. You know, um, uh, what you were just talking about reminds me of some work that uh, one of our faculty members here, uh, Francesca Tripodi, does with looking at how uh, in Wikipedia edits are, are made uh, and the edit wars that take place. Uh, some of her findings, uh, um, you know, demonstrate that, uh, for example, um, women in, in Wikipedia um, uh, get edited out or deleted much more uh, um, uh, um, at higher rates than men for, for the number uh, that are included. And so this notion of um, even in the digital, it, things that are born digital, like Wikipedia, we're already seeing um, you know, some of the, 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 the kinds of um, uh, either lack of connections or, connect, or new connections that, that people are making that are going to change uh, the future, because a uh, hundred years from now, uh, they may not be able to. Somebody will have to rediscover your work because it got it. It it, it uh, was uh, unedited uh, or or changed by this majority of, of people who were um, you know had the privilege to do the editing in in the uh, encyclopedia. Um, I I think we're we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what some of the differences or changes are in this um, in, in, in these born digital materials. Um, one, one thing that that strikes me um, would be really important for um, you know English 101 type classes uh, or Italian 101 type classes would be you know what should authors be doing uh, in addition to just writing their paper? Uh, to 
have some of this secondary documentation. I know our, my students very often use um, Zotera or um, um, you know, various kinds of reference managers. So we, we know where their references are and they connect their reference database to a, an individual paper. And that's a different kind of trace we didn't used to have. Um, but it, we, we probably need to be thinking more about um, mechanisms to help authors get beyond not just the article and making sure I have my abstract and my, you know, mm -hmm. uh, properly formatted text and my references and all of that. But also, how is this going to live afterwards and how does it get connected? And uh, I'm not sure, you know, people are really learning how to do that. Yeah, it, it is difficult and it's very confusing today uh, to get to something which uh, may involve a community of experts because everything is so interdisciplinary by nature. So for instance, lately I had to, I found myself writing self-review, uh, to be a self-reviewer, become a self-reviewer myself, a self-critic. I was so nasty at me. <laughs> and, uh, and, this, and, and writing about my work in third person because just it was impossible to find someone available, not because they didn't want to, but they had no time. And then of course, <laughs> there were uh, so many other distractions. And, and so um, I couldn't uh, just let my work sit there and uh, uh, become the object of misunderstanding because I know it's complex, it's complicated. You know, we do work on complicated matters and issues. So by taking the risk of becoming even the critic of myself, I was uh, hoping to reabsorb all possible misunderstanding which, which a paragraph of mine, for instance, which was complex, could have generated. So I became uh, <laughs> the counterpart of myself and I said, well, this way I will at least avoid in defensive mode I will avoid and prevent this misunderstanding to happen. It's like kind of a reverse of a question and answer, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, fixed uh, uh, paragraphs where pretending that I don't understand and see what I could understand the wrong way so that I can block in some way, stop that by explaining and uh, uh, a lot of exp in interpolation, for instance, in my work, in my, I, Lately, I've been writing a book, books, a couple of books in, in, and each, uh, and each paragraph has a, at least one or two embedded clauses where I explain oh, <laughs> this, the phrase and each sentence in my own, in my native language in Italian, I've done that because I, I saw that, you know, some people weren't understanding it. So it's not even a question of translation. It was just one generation and another one. So I, I had all these notes. They weren't notes, not footnotes. They were just within the text. I had an embedded clause explain what, uh, and trying to prevent misunderstanding to happen. So this is very new and very... Un Never would have I thought that I should do that in the past. But this is the triple W effect on the human mind that you cannot expect other people to do it and you may expect other people will do it wrong unless you uh, you try to facilitate them. That, that's fascinating. I, I mean, I think that I can, I can actually see how, um, how, how valuable that could be. Um, you know, and uh, I think this cascading sort of uh, uh, you know, set of almost self-referential commentary uh, it becomes even more complicated in the age of, of instantaneous social media. Uh, so let's say you, uh, instead of writing this as a book that I was going to spend a year or two years on and then goes to publisher and then eventually it's a completed product. If I'm writing for a, um, you know, uh, an outlet like Medium or or one of these, um, you know, a, 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 a you know a, a blog a, a, a blog sort of environment where I'm writing it actually online. Uh, I might cut and paste and, and paste it in and then post it. But now people are starting to react. In some sense, 
a um, a dialogue that takes place around uh, a, um, uh, a a blog posting is is exactly what you're talking about, but in a microcosm. And um, may, maybe there will be some new possibilities because we'll be able to trace that. You'll be able to go in and say, what was the argumentation uh, around the you know, five comments and the rebuttals and the rebuttals to the rebuttals. Um, and, um, and, but I'm not sure, you know, who's going to collect that. I mean, right now it's, uh, you know, private companies who run these services and they let you use them sometimes for free. Uh, but um, uh, somebody's got to um, sort of capture all of that. I guess tw uh, in in the in the world of Twitter right now, um, Twitter kind of owns all this, and and so um, it's a private company, and that's kind of part of the issue. That's not a public space. If if it were a library doing this, that that was said, everybody can own it, and it'll be made uh, accessible to everyone. To then that would be perhaps a, a better writing environment. That would be totally public, totally open. Um, uh, and um, we would be able to, for posterity, have some of those debates. Um, anyway, I'm just kind of brainstorming. Yeah, yeah. You were definitely uh, commenting on something very important, and some are really open questions. Yeah, you know, these are efforts and trials to cope with gigantics set of overwhelming problems. So there are tentative ways to, to cope with that. I expect that the future, you know, the, the, the key word is selection today. We'll have to select. You know, there is no way that even if we expand, you know, I, for instance, as I mentioned to you, I, I write books. Currently, I write and then I in some way rewrite the explanation of each paragraph to make sure. But I'm very aware of the fact that, of course, you generate a lot of materials. Then you will have to choose after that what you want to keep and package it in a different way. Um, we are transitioning. We are in an era which is one of the most unstable and liquid. You know, liquid is not or fluid is not always a good uh, term, you know, because you're, you know, it's like an earthquake, you know, disciplinary <laughs> zones which collide, collapse, and uh, when this turmoil hit, some entire, you know, groups of people, in this case of documents, may be lost, and uh, so it's hard. But um, we will survive if we can come back with, to this recuperation. Recuperation is not just trying to do things the old way because the world has changed. By recuperation is recuperate the concept which was behind that. And um, for this, I'm saying really the sentiment of research, sentiment is the word which people in finance uh, uh, use a lot. I say, is this a good sentiment? Are you a uh, bear or bull, you know, in, the, in, in that sense? We are going through times which I, I don't think I would have liked to see happen necessarily because they provide you opportunity, but they give you more trouble. So we'll get to a point where um, studies like, you know, library science, information system, um, information system and our, our archival studies will lead us out of this. They are, you know, scholars who work in these areas will save us from all the bad things which can happen and will open up new, a new era where uh, what really matters will stay. But this, you know, this is meant to be um, a, a project which will go through a lot of uh, discontinuities. Um, by indicating some of the main issues like you are doing, uh, we are uh, in some way making explicit what otherwise is the so-called information distress, that people feel uncomfortable, but they don't know what they have. They think it's, it's their fault. You know, information distress is a word to say 
if you feel very embarrassed or very sad or very overwhelmed, it's okay because it's not just you. <laughs> it's the situation. And, um, and uh, uh, another thing, another concept which I would like to convey, when we talk about innovation, innovation in the past or, or let's say before, just 20 years ago or 25 years ago, or at the beginning of, you know, of, the, of the millennium, made a lot of sense. But now when I talk to people and say, let's innovate, and they say, what are you innovating? Are you innovating the innovation of the previous innovation of the previous innovation, which ha you haven't even tested or stabilized? And that needs to be also a question to be raised. You know, at least in Europe here, there is this thing that you have to innovate, but sometimes I haven't even stabilize the, the innovation they have already introduced. <laughs> and uh, so what do you innovate? You scrap everything away unless you go back and you and innovation means going back to the past. It's just like a wheel. So my worries are about, you know, this expression with sometimes some very, um, are very empty of meaning and say, let's innovate. Okay, let's innovate if you see that the, the innovation you have already experienced is working out well, but could be innovate even more. If not so, if you change rules and laws and ways of operating all the time, that's just chaos. Because nothing is ever stable or solid enough to be taken seriously. <laughs> so, it, you know, even the use, the practice of some words is very important and, you know, little things, but they could help uh, the new generation be more supportive, you know, by, uh, by indicating that not all what we did is wrong. Actually, there was a lot of good wisdom and common sense to be used and, uh, and is still there and will make it available. And uh, also avoid a lot of, you know, very reactive and uh, hostile behavior or a lot of, um, uh, in some way, um, um, lack of confidence that a uh, young generation may have. And to say, well, this is what matters to us. You can do it better, but please at least do know what we did and uh, if you don't understand it i'm here to explain you why i did it and and what it is for so i i know we're, we're getting uh, uh, close to our time but i have two two points uh, um one i guess i'll just make uh, i like this uh, um, um this notion of selection that you talk about and that the author the creator is uh, um, making a lot of selections. They select the words. They select the the combination of words. They select the 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 the, the tones and colors if it's if it's a visual. Um, but one of the key uh, principles that archivists learn is is what's called appraisal. How do we appraise the value of something that we then put in the archive? Because once we put it in the archive or take it into our library collection, we are now responsible for it in perpetuity. And so I would think that there uh, might be some good synergies between um, the principles that uh, librarians and archivists learn about uh, the appraisal process and um, juxtaposing that with the kind of um, craft and art that uh, creative people do when they're picking the right words or picking the right color schemes or, or shapes to uh, form their expression. I know there's no, nothing for us to you know, really, um, um, you know, solve here, but it, 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 it's a kind of connection, I guess, I hadn't really thought about before. So thank you for making that selection point. The question, though, I, I did want uh, to uh, ask you is, you know, you, you talked about mode and mood earlier. And, and um, can you say just a little bit more about, you know, about mood and, and because I think that's really important, either one, mode or mood, but capturing mood is another one of those things that I don't think machines are going to be able to do. Just like they have problems with metaphor, I think they have real problems with mood. Yes, um, that has to, to do with, uh, absolutely, I agree, machines could never get there, not even with metaphors, because uh, my in my memory, I recall that once uh, 
you know, the sentence Paul is a lion, which is a, a, a metaphor intended to be very strong. It came out, Paul is, uh, is, uh, has four uh, legs, you know, just like, yeah. So that is not the kind of work machines should do. The mode is the sentiment, the passion around the research is the, act, the positive attitude toward the future, but um, the, the enthusiasm in some way, you know, and uh, um, is never taken for granted what research is. It's not that just the packaging of something and referring something I haven't even read or stuff like that, which I see happen a lot. And uh, um, um, in some way, mood is the recreation in some way of the context of studying, sharing ideas, and uh, um, having conversation, even very harsh ones about, you know, some issues to make it, to make the sculpture, the theory, be perfect. You know, and the struggling for perfection and that emotion is what gave added value to research. If not, it's just like anything else, you know, and I'm saying passion for research. My life has been always like that. You know, I do research, even if I move around, I have to and look for things. I am in a researching mode, but um, doesn't have to get to as extreme as that. But I'm, the sentiment, the feeling, this is why I insist that in some ways, you know, we had this COVID experience, which was terrible for everyone, but we need to get back to classrooms and to establish in contact. And a lot of violence, which I see happen in the world today, is also due to the fact that people are so afraid of connecting, they are not used any longer, you know, to the real interaction and, and then becomes extreme. So um, maybe I was privileged because I always managed to be in research places and my visit in the United States were incredible for that. We used to have a lot of conversation about and the passion for reading. Now I have, you know, in the last years, I see people, they, they are in some way negotiating the amount of papers to read because they count on it as if it was just like a job that you get paid <laughs> minimum wage. <laughs> hour by hour <laughs> you need to know i i come from a tradition where you need to know 100 to be able to tell one <laughs> so you need to read 100 to be able to write one you know and uh, you need to know much more and curiosity you know never stop being curious and uh, so that is hard to recreate certainly machines won't be able but it will be hard on our <clears throat> On our, in our system as well, because we come out of years which were really difficult. But the winning part for any university, any department will be that one. Recreate that context. Um, I, we're, we're at time. Uh, um, Graziella, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful, uh, engaging conversation. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. And um, uh, this will be available on, on YouTube. Uh, and... Um, uh, thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much to you as well. It's been a pleasure and honor. And um, to the next conversation. <laughs> See you soon. And have a good evening. <laughs>